2012. We're here in the office of Dr. Enrico Benedetti uh, at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and we're going to uh, do an interview with Dr. Benedetti on uh, his life story and maybe uh, some uh, uh, ideas, attitudes, uh, uh, other stuff that uh, he can enlighten us with. Uh, welcome, Dr. Benedetti. Thank you. This is for the Italian Cultural Center, Casa Italia Library, and any other things that we may win an Academy Award for. Who knows? <laughs> Wish you good luck. <laughs> so, uh, tell us uh, first your life story. Uh, when you were born, where, and all that. Early childhood uh, memories that you might have, early influences. Uh, that sort of thing. Sure, so I was born in uh, uh, Perugia, which is a city in Umbria, um, in uh, 1960. And I grew up uh, in another Umbrian city called Gubbia, where I stayed until I was 18. I went to the school and so forth. And that's where really my family lived to this day. In, in Gubbia, we Gubbia, went to, yes. to school and uh, just the ordinary Italian uh, public yeah, I school? I went to Liceo Classico, so it's a course of study that focuses on philosophy, Greek, Latin, literature, so it's uh, called the Classic Lyceum. And not necessarily science? Not much science at all, hardly any. So that's actually, uh, in Italy, is a very common uh, preparation for all the university study. Most of our uh, graduates from the university come to that school, which are classic. Okay, so uh, Italians uh, seem to be more sophisticated no matter what their field is because they started off with the classics. <laughs> yeah, I studied five years philosophy, eight years Latin, five years Greek, uh, mm -hmm. eight years history, stuff like that. Uh, was uh, traditional religion important in your family? Um, my father is quite religious. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a very Catholic family. I cannot tell that I'm the most uh, accurate uh, afterward. I've been pretty lax, let's say. Mm -hmm. But I grew up in a very uh, religious family. Okay, and uh, uh, celebrated saints' feasts, etc. Does Gubbio have a, a patron saint? Yes, yeah, Santubaldo. Okay. which was the Bishop of Gubbio in the 13th century. Uh -huh. And apparently saved the city from a couple of disasters, including war, famine, and so forth. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, do you remember any uh, uh, individual teacher or inspiration uh, uh, for you when you were going through school in Gubbio? I had um, several great teachers, I must say. The most impressive of all was our Latin and Greek teacher. His, uh, his name is Professor Stirati. He's a former senator of the Italian Republic, so man of culture, man of civic commitment. And uh, he really made us love the Latin literature that I still do. Uh, so you studied uh, uh, about the, the Greeks and the Romans and all the, uh, uh, the literature and the history of Absolutely. the ancient world. Uh, in, uh, to this day, I still uh, read mostly liter uh, literature history book. Mm -hmm. I rarely read fiction or any other. So I read mostly uh, medieval history mm -hmm. like and uh, the history of the Roman Republic, the last century. I'm as good as any uh, professor of history. Okay, well, uh, there's another uh, career for you. <laughs> in that part, I could, uh, yeah, I could teach a class. <laughs> Uh, That's my hobby. I read it all, all the time. Oh, so. uh, very good. And um, uh, so you you studied uh, uh, hard. You were you you were first in your class, or what was? I tend to be on top of the class yeah, throughout uh, my life. Uh, now, I had something written down. I was going to ask you later, but have you had, ever had any setbacks, any uh, hardships, or? Um, uh, setback in uh, being failed to exam or uh, repeating years no, I didn't. Well, I never there's some it. disappointments. And I've been pretty lucky, I shouldn't say in public, but pre pretty lucky in my life. Yeah. Uh -huh. but the main uh, uh, 
bad uh, no, event in my life. I was very close to my grandfather, was oh. really close. And he died when I graduated from medical school in 1985. That to me was really a tragedy. So you, you lost your That's, dad? I guess, the last time I really cried. You know? uh -huh. What, uh, what, uh, your grandpa, uh, what uh, mestiere did he have? My grandfather worked actually in uh, the mine in France, iron mines, oh. and he got silicosis and he died from uh, that. Ah, okay. So he, that's maybe where emigration uh, touches your family history. Right. And my other grandfather I never met because he died, was actually a U.S. citizen, mm -hmm. and he had, um, a very comfortable life in Pennsylvania until he decided to go back to fight for Italy during the Second World War. Oh. Which retrospective it was a mistake. Oh, okay. <laughs> a costly mistake. Uh -huh. did, uh, did he uh, perish in the war? or? Um, not really, but uh, he pretty much uh, uh, lost most of what he had because mm -hmm. he was sort of successful in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and in the process of the post-war, the devaluation of Liras and similar. He lost most of his ass. Did he go back to Italy because of his fascist feelings? or? I don't know exactly, but oh, I, I know okay. that he came back uh, to fight the war. Mm -hmm. um, and he was not even uh, very young when he came back, but mm -hmm. he wanted to be back. Uh, yeah. As you probably know, as an historian, actually in U.S. history, um, between uh, no, Hoover, the FBI, and uh, some of the president, a uh, lot of Italian for good reason, were you know, discriminated, uh, put in uh, camps, uh, expelled from the country. So I think the background was like he was no longer welcome in the U.S. Uh -huh. I mean, understandably, it was yeah. a time of war. But yeah. Well, uh, folks from the left and the right, uh, Italians have uh, had their uh, their problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you were born in 1960. Italy was coming out of the uh, depths of uh, uh, problems after World War II. So uh, there were probably, had your family suffered uh, any that you can recall or that they not talked about during the war? We were not rich, but we did not suffer, no. Especially in the 60s, we did quite well, I would say. Uh, and your parents were both teachers? Yes. At the school that you went to, or the schools that you went to? Oh, my father did teach me for a few years. Yeah. Oh, that <laughs> was my teacher directly. That must have been an interesting thing. And were Italian schools still the way that uh, they're portrayed in Italian movies? Uh, uh, kind of strict and a little bit... Uh... Well, I, I train in very strict environment in all the uh, level of school. I mean, a lot more serious than uh, what I can see today in Italy. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, Italy has changed as well. Uh, the, the school was strict. We had a lot of home assignment, a lot of uh, uh, learning by heart. But mm -hmm. that really uh, was a good exercise for medicine. Because you better know a lot of things memorized if you want to be effective, especially if a crisis arises. Okay. So, the iPad won't do? Uh, well, I, I think that uh, the new generation and the new uh, model of education, which is more interactive, has pretty much eliminated you know, the um, use of memory. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a mistake. Yeah. It's a mistake because sometimes you don't have time to go to the internet to yeah. solve your problem. Okay. When you're in surgery, you don't have access to the internet. You need to memorize a lot of information that needs to come back to you rapidly. Now, in Italy, when you uh, go to university after uh, the Liceo Classico, mm -hmm. uh, did you, were you determined to become a doctor? Right. I, I decided early on to become a doctor. Actually, not even a doctor. I want to become a surgeon. I was set uh, for surgery even before I started medical school. Mm -hmm. So, now, uh, was there something about surgery? There your hands, uh, that sort of I thing? I didn't have any role model in the family. Uh, I think I've been the first in my family to go uh, to, the, to get a degree in medicine. Um, I just uh, like uh, the field. 
Mm. So I read about biography of fam famous surgeon like Alsted, and uh, I thought that that's the way I want to make a living. Okay, and uh, what about the, your uh, adolescent years? You, you a big soccer fan or player? Uh, or? That's what we did. We play soccer from morning to dawn. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, you're an Italian through and through as far as uh, the sports are concerned. Any other activities, music, or...? Uh... Yeah, we, we all did some. Um, back then I played guitar, we sing, uh, we, we went out a lot. It was a happy time. It was a very safe environment. Mm -hmm. Close group of friends, are still my friends. Yeah. How, how big is Kupia? Yeah. About 35,000. 35? Oh, that's bigger than I, I thought. Okay, that's a nice size. So, uh, did you go, uh, did you have to go through a general university curriculum and then medical concentration, no, or was it from the beginning? The way it works, worked at least back then, uh, we would go through this Liceo Classico between uh, uh, 13 to 18 years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we would uh, sign up for the university. It was not like a fixed number of people applying medicine. Mm -hmm. And I went through six years of medicine at the total cost of about four hundred fifty dollars. Oh, okay, that's a good investment, I <laughs> think, for everybody concerned. <laughs> that's the, the tax that I paid every year, a less than one one hundred dollar a year. Of course, my family had to support me in Florence. I went to Florence to the university, so they had to pay for my you know, uh, rent and stuff like that. Okay, did you have a cadaver? Ever. Oh, meaning for anatomy exercise? Yeah, in, in one of your own? No, we had uh, access to anatomy lab, yes. Okay, but... You don't I, want to own any cadaver. <laughs> <laughs> they don't last. Uh, they, uh, well, I was under the impression that uh, Italian uh, uh, medical schools uh, did not have so much hands-on labs as the American This is state. correct. We, we had, um, the system was uh, actually such that a lot of people went to, the, uh, to medicine. Um, in the U.S., as much as in Italy, the medical profession has been always sought after, as you know. And uh, they generate more doctors than what they need back then, no doubt. So there's a surplus of doctors that are still paying. Mm -hmm. um, the way the selection was made, uh, when I uh, start uh, the College of Medicine in Florence, we have 1,900 people in the first year, which were down to 280 by the second year, because the um, uh, exams were extraordinarily difficult. Florence uh, was famous in Italy for how difficult it was to get through the exam. So a lot of people quit the first year. Many other quit during the... In fact, when I graduated five and a half years later in July, I started in 79, July 1985. I was the first one in my class to graduate. Everybody else graduated later or never. Oh, okay. So getting through, is this five years? Or six, six years. years. Six, six years. So it's the equivalent of um, you know, the college plus the, co the medicine year. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, as you're right, we did not have a lot of access to support and so on, exercitation, but the theory. We knew it. I mean, we had a cruel exam. Nothing written test. Everything was, yeah, it's the book. The professor open a page and he wants you to talk about that particular subject. I could never understand that. Uh, uh, the oral exams, uh, doing oral exams of hundreds and hundreds of students in the same field. Uh, I know that wasn't true in medicine. They didn't have that many students, but how, how do they evaluate that? Uh, how do you compare one to another? Uh, there is a, a degree, of course, uh, of uh, unfairness, because uh, uh, everything is in the oral exam. It's not like there is a taped record of it. Yeah. So the professor has a lot of authority. Yeah. And of course, you can exercise that in the proper way or favoring uh, people and so forth. So it's a little bit dangerous in that regard. Yeah. 
But if you're a good student and you pass uh, an oral exam of this nature, there is no written test that can compare. It's a lot more difficult. The written test at least reminds you of a couple of options, right? Yeah. Well, I've, I've graded you know, thousands and thousands of uh, papers, and you know, you, I circle good points, and you have something to hang on to. But in a conversation, uh, uh, what did he say? Did he say that exactly that way? So, yeah. Uh, anyhow, that's a, 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 bit, a major difference in the way that testing goes on. Right now, it's become more and more American style. They do a lot more written tests. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess in 10 years, it will be exactly the same all over the world. Okay, did you uh, do uh, work around the hospital when you were a student? Yeah, I, I, I actually start uh, going to the Department of Surgery at the University of Florence when I was uh, a second-year student, immediately. And I never stopped going. While I was studying, I would go every morning to that. Okay, do you follow a, a professor around in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the rounds? Yes. Then I had uh, no, some uh, due in terms of uh, writing notes, uh, preparing presentations, studying subjects, writing paper. And I educated myself in that environment since I was uh, only 21 years old. Always been in the surgical environment of my life. Okay. And then you graduated from medical school? 1985. What? 1985, you would have been 25? Okay, and is that when you came no. to the U.S.? I did uh, a full residency in surgery in Florence. Okay. In November of uh, 1985, I started uh, a surgical residency in Florence. And uh, in general, even the surgical residency, there is not a lot of hands-on. Uh, but I, I, I found a good mentor, and uh, I did my share of cases. Okay, so by the time I came to the U.S. in '89, I was already, a, no, I would say, medium-level surgeon. I could do simple and medium-level cases independently. Okay, so what about that decision to come to the U.S.? How did that come about? Well, it's an interesting series of events. I I start uh, uh, in. Uh, in the university. In Italy there are two kinds of hospitals, university hospital mm -hmm. and community hospital. And um, they are respectively universitari, the doctors that practice in the university, ospedalieri, mm -hmm. the people that work in the community hospital. And of course the uni university has always been uh, looking down to the other guys. <laughs> and uh, Florence was not different back then. And I was in the Clinica Universitaria. Uh, I finished on top of the class, I graduated under 10, cum laude. Um, I, I was a prime choice, and in fact I immediately got in. Mm -hmm. And as I got in, uh, within uh, two years, uh, I came to hate that environment. I came to hate that environment. So, you know, people 50 years old still assisting the professor, still treated like nobodies, disrespect, and so forth. So by the second year, I slammed the door in the face of the professor, Allegra, that was his name. Literally? I did, yeah. Oh. And I moved to the uh, hospedale, the regular community hospital that is in the same uh, complex in Florence. Mm -hmm. And um, there they treated me extremely well. So but then, uh, when I left the university, I immediately took the test. And uh, back then they had some called ECFMG. And there was a worldwide test, now it's called USEMELI, they give the same test that medical students in this country take. Back then there were two tests called USEMELI, uh, sorry, uh, called ECFMG. And I took the test in Florence and I scored very good. Although I didn't speak much English, I knew medicine. So I scored like 99th percentile worldwide. The Good. test was in English? Of course. We had uh, all the tests, uh, multiple choice mm -hmm. in English, plus we had the TOEFL, the English proficiency test. Oh. Okay, now, uh, yeah, that brings me to the other question of 
uh, how you uh, learned English. Well, well I, I could read English well. In fact, I scored well in this test. I did the test fast. I found that easy to do. And um, my uh, spoken English wasn't very good back then. And my understanding was not great. But good enough that I passed the TOEFL. TOEFL is not a difficult test. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, even from my point of view, I, a lot of the vocabulary is the same uh, when it, it, in, uh, in the medical field in English and, and in Italian. This is correct. This is yeah, correct. So, so that's, that, that's an aid. Uh, Small but, aid. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you scored very well, and then w what happens then? Was there well? I thought that since I scored so well, uh, the U.S. university would fight over me to get them to train with them. So I sent my application to 98 university for that many. Well, that's what they advised me to do it. Oh, being foreign. And guess what? Nobody wanted even to interview me. I, have you talked to any of those people uh, recently uh, who no, <laughs> turned no, no, you no. down? I do the same, I do the same. Another, uh, I'm actually the uh, chairman of this department. Yeah. Um, we have uh, six positions for surgical residents. Yeah. We have 1,300 applications. Ah, yeah, so. We have uh, about 400 foreigners. And the foreigner, we don't even read the application, we just throw it away. Ah. Don't even go to the details. Because, of course, uh, we prefer to have a U.S. trained individual. Unless the foreign individual has done something spectacular in the field of research, has worked with us many years, we know personally, then we give them the opportunity for interview. Okay. Well, then how did you get around that rejection? Of, uh... Well, I studied the problem. I went to the U.S., I traveled, I talked with people. I understood how the system worked. I was naive about it. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that, of course, there is a bias against the foreign trained physician to enter competitive specialty like surgery. America wants to go into surgery because, let's face it, it's a well paid specialty, right? So a lot of Americans like to do it. So, first of all, I understood that you need to have something special to get into, to pass the first order, go to the residency. Because I knew that afterward would be a fair fight. If you go into the system, then the better one will go forward. This is a fact that is still true in this country, at least in medicine. So my problem was to be able to show what I could do. And uh, I used a combination of strategy. Number one, uh, I studied the situation of uh, university in this country. I knew that somebody was in crisis, right? There's always mm. somebody in crisis. Yeah. But if they're solid institution, the crisis is usually temporary. So you don't want to go to an institution that is doomed to failure. But let's say University of Illinois, 1989, they may close the hospital here. They may move all the doctor to Michael Reese. You may remember this fact. Uh, Looks like that. Anyway, that's what happened. I found out about that. University of Illinois, a very prestigious university, a university that's given to the world 26 Nobel Prize winner. Um, in that respectable department of surgery, you've seen the, my predecessor, famous surgeon, was in a crisis because they were shutting down this hospital and moved to Macquarie's. Private hospital now is actually closed, they need to turn. And the American student, that choice, didn't want to go into a situation of turmoil. So I saw it as an opportunity. The University of Illinois is a state university, will not go down. They will come back, right? Maybe the hospital will be different, but who cares? So I concentrate my attention on this university immediately. And then uh, I tried to find an internal help. And that the man that helped me, Professor Nius. That's actually his portrait done by the patients. So did you meet him at a conference, or did you come to the U.S. and knock on his door? Or? Um, Professor Nius was uh, the American president of an organization 
that uh, is called the International College of Surgeons. Mm -hmm. And this International College of Surgeons, of which I'm still part, of course, as um, president of a uh, uh, European chapter, uh, North American chapter, Asian chapter. So Dr. News was the American president. And Dr. Speranza, a famous surgeon from Rome, Italy, was the president of the European chapter. Mm -hmm. And I went to talk with Dr. Speranza. Uh, I explained to him what I intended to do. He, he thought he saw something in me. So he recommended me to Dr. News. I came to Chicago. Again, I had an opportunity because few Americans were interested. In fact, in my year, there were a lot of foreign nationals. Mm -hmm. Because I was right. Americans don't like to go in a place where they storm out if their choice is right. Mm -hmm. So I got in as a resident uh, at University of Illinois in uh, 1989. So what was your first impression of Chicago? Well, I came in January 1989 with minus 25 centigrade. Uh, the city was uh, not uh, nearly as uh, pleasant as it is now. We have been here a long time, you remember. Chicago wasn't much in 89. The growth has been in the last 20 years, at the beautification of the city. Plus uh, the climate, plus the fact that I didn't speak English. And in fact, uh, I had to solve the problem of the interview. When I interviewed with Dr. News and two other directors of the program here, my English was horrid. I did not understand. So what I did, I, uh, during my previous travel, I wrote down maybe 40 commonly asked questions in surgical <laughs> interviews. And you know, to, to this date, you, you end up asking the same thing, right? You may ask uh, why you want to become a surgeon. You may ask uh, what's the best clinical case you've ever seen. You may ask what's your motivation as a doctor. There are like a finite number of stuff that is asked. So I have 40 questions, 40 answers, well written, reviewed by experts memorized. So if you ask me something that sounds like uh, how, how do you, want, you want me to explain why I want to become a surgeon, is question number 13. <laughs> and here's the answer with no hesitation, right? So I fully into believing that my English was fluent, mm -hmm. whereas now it was not. It was not. But in 89 I start uh, I learn English rapidly, mostly at Cook County, so I still understand uh, slang better than uh, white American. <laughs> For an African American patient, I understand them better than most of my colleagues. So that's the English I learn, you see. I learn at Cook <laughs> County Hospital and Michael Reese at the University of Illinois Hospital at the VA. So no, no, I never step my foot in an English school in my life. Mm. And I, I saw on your resume that you speak Spanish and... Yeah, Spanish, yes. What else? Um, that's it. Oh, you had something else on the resume. No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> no, no, no. It Italian, and Spanish, and English. Okay. okay. But that's all you need, I guess, in 2012. Mm -hmm. French okay. is a dead language, German is a dead language, and so forth. Okay, so you got... It. In as a resident, mm -hmm. and what a residency is what? Uh, in the U.S., there are um, five years of training in surgery. The first year is called internship, and it's the same for all the specialty. So I did one year as an intern, and then uh, uh, I um, sort of rapidly move up because I was better than my peer. I had more experience, I could operate. Mm -hmm. So I was chosen as the best intern of the year. It was not fair, because these people were right off medical school. I had five years of training. Mm -hmm. So I could operate as good as no, third, fourth, fifth year resident. And that has begun to show more and more, right? So by the second year, they moved me up to fourth. I skip a year. They didn't think I need to. And the American Board of Surgery actually support that decision. And uh, then I finish in about you know, three and a half years, the five years curriculum. Okay, so
So it was really an advantage that you, your Italian background and training gave you an advantage in this situation? Well, again, usually Italian training wasn't that good, but I was lucky enough that um, this doctor where I went after the second year really taught me how to operate. Mm -hmm. So by the end of the fifth year, I was actually pretty good. Um, what the, oh, there are, this is a little bit off the topic, but they talk about um, in the field of uh, mathematics, for instance, uh, uh, most geniuses break through when they're really young. On the other hand, the historians do their best work when they're old. What about uh, surgeons? Well, Italian surgeons tend to become, uh, uh, at least back then, uh, chairman, the place where they operate, late in life. This is not good. This is not good because surgery, unlike history, is uh, actually a technical field where you need to perform. You need to perform uh, for a long time at strange hours under difficult circumstances. You want to have the best eyesight, the best muscular strength, the best uh, endurance. So the ideal surgeon is somebody that is trained rapidly in early age that will pick his uh, skill by age 34, 35. Mm -hmm. That's the best surgeon. Okay, and so later on you uh, do the other things. Um, okay, proceeding with your career, you're always here, you get through your residency. Now, during your residency, is that when you went up to Minnesota, or? No, after, uh, after completing my residency. So I finished this uh, general surgery residency at University of Illinois, and uh, they let me finish a little early, and I start uh, in uh, April. 1993, the fellowship in Minnesota in transplantation. Oh, uh, okay, getting back to your personal life, you had a sweetheart in Italy right. before you came here, and then... I married her a year after I, I arrived in this country, in 1990, mm -hmm. and then she followed me. She's a prudent woman. Oh, I guess she so. She came <laughs> to see if she would, uh, would like Chicago. She did like it, and then she came back. Uh, so, it was did this uh, cause a problem? Yeah, just leaving your own country. Uh, uh, and did you intend to leave for good when you left? Oh yeah, I intend. I didn't uh, want to go back and forth. I intended to practice in the United States. Okay, because your frustration with the Italian system. You see, you ask me a very pertinent question. When do you think a surgeon would express his best? And I give you my answer. Yeah. You, you should pick by age 33, 35. You should pick. Yeah. So you do the training up to 29, you have five, six years to perfect. You should pick at that age, which I did. Uh -huh. And I could not have done it in Italy. They would have kept me under you know, the master for a very long period of time. So they, okay, I, I, I see your point. And so that, that definitely, but what about leaving all the things Italian, the wonderful Italian culture? Let me see, I'm, I'm a guy that works very hard. Even to this day that I could have allowed to work less. I come at six, I go home at eight, very often I work at night. Mm -hmm. For me, work is very important. I wouldn't be happy if I don't like where I work. Uh -huh. So that's actually overwhelming. Have you gone back to Italy often? Uh, Not initially. Mm -hmm. I didn't go back for almost five years. At all? Because I, I didn't take vacation, you see. Uh -huh. This accelerated training means that I give up all my vacation for five years. Because I wanted to finish fast. So. Year after year, I gave up vacation to move faster. What is about America that, that didn't have to do with the medical stuff mm. did you like the most? I think the fairness of the system. That's what I like the most. Okay. I don't know. In other fields, I cannot speak for engineering, for lawyers, and so 
Madison's a fair field. I assume. Uh, there are uh, objective results <laughs> and outcomes. Uh, what didn't you like about American life? Well, in the uh, early uh, 90s in Chicago, I didn't like the food. There was almost, uh, you know, with few exceptions, the, the food uh, is not what I was accustomed to. Uh, Chicago did not experience this extraordinary improvement in services, restaurant, uh, grocery that we witnessed in the last 15 years. So I was not very happy with that. Were you always looking for cibo italiano? I did, I did. I mean, I was uh, a guy that uh, grew up in Italy, and I travel, of course, but I was Italian through and through. So I didn't like almost anything except Italian food. Mm. I didn't even like French. Mm. I still don't. And did you eat best when you cooked for yourself or your wife <laughs> cooked for you? Well, of course, the moment my wife came, the situation <laughs> did improve because she found the time to, there were already some good Italian store, mostly in Harlem Street, and I may remember Gina's on Harlem Street. Yeah. Yeah. There were a few places where if you had patience to look and travel, you would get what you need. Oh, so, okay, good. But plus, in America, it's truly a melting pot. I start liking other culture as much as their food. And uh, what uh, did you miss in Italy besides the food? Uh, about well, my my close friend and my family, that's about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you build a, a network of uh, Italian friends? Definitely. There's a lot of Italian like me in Chicago. So uh, what, would, that, uh, what would you call yourself? And, an immigrant? Are you an immigrant? No doubt I am. I mean, <laughs> how can I deny that fact? Yeah. I'm an you came for pane e lavoro? Lavoro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you would you consider yourself an expatriate? A, I wouldn't say so because you see, I had choice. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, in Florence, when I was ready to go, I had a job. I told you. Yeah enough for me in Florence that would have surely, so I was not desperate to leave. Mm -hmm. I think that's the difference between the generation that emigrate after the Second World War, mm -hmm. that either they die of hunger or they emigrate, or people of my generation. All the friends that I have in Chicago, Italian, are well educated, uh, with university degree, that do jobs that are Lawyer as much as professor of finance at the University of Chicago, as much as lo uh, doctors and so forth. So these people actually choose to come, mm -hmm. and of course there are different levels of education. Invite me to your next party. I would like to meet them. <laughs> well, there's a lot of people that. Uh, okay, well, let's. Uh, I think we were in the mid uh, '90s. Uh, 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 you went to Minnesota for is, what kind of surgery? Uh, transplantation. Transplantation. Yeah. Okay, so it, uh, the robo wasn't in the picture. Robot it, was not even approved yet. Okay. No, no, we did it open. Kidney, pancreas, liver, bowel. Yeah. That's what I still do. Mm -hmm. That's my specialty. Oh, and what's your take on how a, a surgeon gets the, the guts to do this, to cut and to paste. <laughs> this, this is an interesting question because I've seen a few things. For example, some people never have it. And it's evident since the beginning of their training that they will never will. You can tell how successful the surgeon will be by the second, third year in training, no doubt. Interesting is people that had it, people that at one point they were bold, aggressive, surgeon, ready to take risk, they may lose it. They may lose it. For reasons that very often have to do with some traumatic experience, either personal or professional. And when they lose it, they will not get it back. They will be afraid to go to the operating room. That's truly, truly a tragedy. And I've seen in my career at least four or five of people like this. 
So it really is a, a dramatic thing. Uh, I mean, if I'm a historian, if I make a mistake, you know, You'd be criticized. I'd be criticized. <laughs> but, you know, if you make a mistake, they get buried. Uh, uh, for example, this morning uh, I took a kidney from a, a young lady, 39, that was donating to a sister. Sister being morbidly obese, I did the operation with the robotic system to avoid a large incision. So think about if I make a mistake, I saw the artery wrong, I bleed, I clap the artery, I lose the kidney, or make the donor suffer complication with donor bleeding or death. So those are tremendous consequences. And uh, each time we do an operation in various degrees, some are simpler, some are more complicated, a lot is at stake. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you need to be confident that you do a good job. So you cannot go there with fear. If you're afraid, you'll fail. Mm -hmm. But and you get your confidence from from training, from mm -hmm. competence, from endurance, mm -hmm. knowing what are your reaction under stress. Okay. So was it? Uh, two years in Minnesota? Two years, yes. And then you came back here? Yeah, I and came back here in um, late 1994. Okay, and you began doing a lot of these transplants? Yeah, I was um, the junior partner of the division chief at the time. Mm -hmm. Heart transplant is a different field? Heart transplant are done mostly by cardiac surgeon. Heart and lung are done by cardiac surgeon. And then, uh, so going along, I can see from these awards from different years, Chicago Magazine always had you among the top doctors, uh, et cetera. When did Robo come along? The robot came along in uh, uh, August 2000. Mm -hmm. In August 2000, we, we, the FDA approved the system. And uh, we actually acquired a system early on. We acquired a system in uh, September of that year. Why U of I? So, so it's, it's not so much the institution, it's the people that work for a place. We just had the impression that this was a radical change that would uh, bring uh, important benefits to patients. So we got into it. And for my part, I started doing mostly the donor operation with the robot, meaning mm -hmm. Instead of doing open surgery, we do through a tiny cut, like a C-section, mm -hmm. and a few smaller cuts for the instrument. And uh, it's very beneficial in terms of pain and suffering. People go on sooner, they have less pain, they recover faster. So uh, you make a small incision, then you put it in a tube, and it has all the... Uh, yeah, curious, uh, tools that go in here and there and do the job? If you're curious, I will show you a little short video so you understand how it works. It's difficult to explain by word. But it's not different conceptually than laparoscopic surgery. Yeah. Surgery that you do through a camera with instrument that go through small part in the abdomen mm -hmm. that is distended by CO2 insufflation. Um, and there's a camera in there or something? Uh, 3D camera. Yeah. So, uh, who invented the robots? Uh, who developed? Most of the development has been done by the U.S. Ministry of Defense. Mm -hmm. They were talking, um, hoping to use for field operation mm -hmm. to keep their surgeons safe and have robots taking care of soldiers. Mm -hmm. And then um, private company, American as well, Intuitive Surgical. They bought these patents, closed down their only competitor, and uh, since then they have actually a monopoly of these surgical robots. Oh, okay. Now, did you have uh, anything to do with, is it Da Vinci? No, no, we have what? nothing to do with it. The name? I know that there was some uh, Italian uh, engineer in the team that uh, put the robot together. We know even his name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they, I think uh, they wanted to give the impression of something ingenious, okay. ahead of the time, uh, original, and they use uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Mm. So 
in robo surgery, it's probably on the uh, video, but do you sit in one room and the surgeon, the patient's in another room and you go like this, like play, playing a video you're, game? You're sitting in the same room, but uh, <laughs> the um, console where you control the robotic instrument is separated physically from the patient. So one day probably we can interact uh, in wireless fashion in a distance. So it would be surely possible. It's already there. So like the drone. We already like connect by cables, right? Yeah. So it's just a matter to find a way to exchange this information rapidly. Apparently you need to have uh, the ability to react to the image within 300 milliseconds. So just a simple you know, engineering problem that has been already virtually solved. Mm. Of course, there is a problem in uh, operating at a distance liability control. What was the, your first uh, robo-surgery like? Uh, we thought that uh, compared to laparoscopy, which uh, is uh, executed watching a flat screen to the, through in natural movement, uh, through long instrument and not ar articulated, we thought that uh, robotic would bring that to the table. Mm -hmm. Better articulation, more steady, uh, more uh, precise imaging because it's a 3D image. So there were a lot of mechanical advantages of laparoscopy. But the most radical revolution is that for the first time, between you and the patient, there is a computer. There is an interface. In, in that interface, you can do a lot of things. A lot of things that are now happening. Is this the future? How, how long do we have to wait before um, the majority of surgery is robotic or whatever? Well, I think there are some limitations in the cost of the equipment, the fact that um, the company has a monopoly, mm -hmm. the fact that um, there is a high cost of acquisition, high cost of maintenance, high cost for instrument. And laparoscopy does quite well. Um, however, uh, in some field, uh, and I'll give you one for all, uh, the robotic is already taking over. For example, in urology for uh, prostate surgery, for prostate cancer, mm -hmm. last year 85% of the prostatectomy in this country were done with the robot. Oh. That's the field where the robot had the higher penetration. So you don't do that, though? No, is the it Europe not important would, enough? Or? No, no, it's not my specialty. Okay. No, the U.S. Uh, like specialized doctor. Okay. You go to a doctor, you want a transplant, you want a transplant doctor, but that's what he does. Mm -hmm. So I specialize in transplant and hepatobiliary surgery, liver resection and like. Mm -hmm. So the, the robo-surgery is especially suited to transplant? Well, we uh, used it rather than uh, laparoscopy for the donor. And we mm -hmm. had a good experience. We had done almost 850 of this operation. We never transfuse anybody. We do it in a very fast fashion. Our hour and a half, we're very pleased. Minimal pain and suffering. So. But this is not different than uh, what you can do laparoscopically. So other centers do the same operation that I described to you yeah. laparoscopically. We do with the robot because we are more confident that we will not make mistakes. But you can do laparoscopically very successfully. The kidney transplant is very difficult to do laparoscopically. And uh, the robot gives you a tremendous help in suturing because it's very difficult to suture through laparoscopy. Mm. And uh, the key, key part of the operation is to suture the vessel of the new kidney to the vessel of the recipient which I just did it two hours ago with the robot very successfully. Mm. So the system take away any tremor, give you the three division. It's the same articulation as human wrist, actually more, because my wrist can do 180 degree, mm -hmm. while the robot can go 180, you reset, you go 360. Yeah. So it's actually give a superhuman capability. Oh. I'm right-handed. I cannot suture in open with my left, I can suture with the robot. 
So, so the robot isn't right-handed or left-handed? No, you have two instruments and you can use them differently. Oh. Yeah. Uh, oh. So that started in what year? Uh, 2000. 2000, the robo-surgery. And uh, it, there's been, I assume, growth yeah, in that period. We had, uh, no, we were early adopters, so we, we did uh, adopter and we did a good number of operations. We did about 650 operations between uh, 2000, 2005, 2006. Mm -hmm. And then that's when uh, I became the head of the department and uh, our previous robotic surgeon, which was an Argentinian man, left. Mm -hmm. So I called the Piero Giovinotti, that is my uh, friend and partner, yeah, yeah. that is truly the pioneer in robotic surgery. If you want to hear about who is the pioneer of robotic surgery, you need to talk to Piero Giulianotti. He's the first one that did, uh, no, and you met him. Mm -hmm. He's the first one that yeah. did uh, lung surgery, liver surgery, pancreatic surgery with the robot before anybody else. And uh, to this day, he's the leader. That's yeah. why we did more than anybody else in this city and in this country, thanks to Piero. And a uh, summary of his background, he's Italian from where? He's Italian from Tuscany. Tuscany, right. He's, um, he was professor of surgery at the University of Pisa, Pisa. He's very prominent in Italy. Had some fight with his chairman, went to a small hospital in Grosseto. Mm -hmm. Grosseto is one of the provinces of Tuscany. So this is a man who had extensive experience on open surgery. He done a lot of open surgery, he's 57 mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And then he did a lot of laparoscopic surgery. So when he got to the robot, he knew already what he was doing. Okay, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and uh, he really did uh, a lot for the field. Now, you're teaching robotic so uh, surgery yeah, to have, uh, um, uh, medical students? Not to medical students, but to surgical residents, yes. To colleagues that come from other countries or from this country, we do. We have actually an Italian, uh, Mr. Pasquinelli, mm -hmm. Bruno Pasquinelli, that donated us enough money to buy a robot for the lab and contribute to buy the robot that we have in the operating room that I just used. Oh. Yeah, Bruno Pasquinelli, yeah, he's from the south suburbs originally. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he's a big builder, yeah. yeah. He built uh, many suburban homes. And 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond. Uh, he gave money to uh, Governor's State for the, uh, but this is much more important. <laughs> it was for. He's been our biggest uh, uh, contributor. I mean, just to tell you how much we own to the Italian American of the city. Okay, and and what about uh, Italian Americans uh, uh, in the city? You, you mentioned a little bit about going to Harlem Avenue, uh, the uh, Geno's imports? Uh, I, yeah, I'm sorry that it's closed. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I did a little, my last book had four or five pages on, on his exploits, but uh, <coughs> uh, you were honored by the Joint Civic Committee uh, a few years yeah, back at the yeah. Bernardine Award, and uh, uh, any other identification? Have you marched in the Columbus Day Parade? Has you they put your robot really, in the parade? They put me on some uh, yeah, car. <laughs> Try the same group, you know, the joint uh, committee for Italian American. Uh -huh. So, yeah, and um, of course, uh, since then I had some interaction with the group that uh, you know, provided me the support and the prize. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're uh, pretty much at the top of your field. Are you going off to conferences every week? And uh, Frankly, I could, <laughs> but I try not to. I go only to uh, meeting that I consider important or meeting that occur in Italy. I usually say yes. Oh, OK. Uh, but I say not to a lot of meetings this year. So. Uh, what what are your predictions of the future for the robo surgery, surgery in general? You? Well, we are uh, 
finding application for this particular technology. I mentioned this uh, in application in kidney transplantation, which I believe one of the best. Mm -hmm. uh, people that have uh, BMI over 40, they are obese, mm -hmm. they are refused by everybody. So yeah. they die on dialysis. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Well, no, as doctor, we don't pass judgment. We take care of people, right? Yeah. And this way we can take care of them. We can do the operation safely, fast, uh, with no incision, no complication. We've done over 60 already. And the, the survival rate in years? Yeah, uh, 96% percent in one year, which is as good as anybody in the world, not in the country. So it's working well. That's going to be a, a great application. In general, the people that are more likely to uh, benefit from robotic are obese individuals. Mm -hmm. Because as we operate on them in open surgery, we have tremendous wound complication. The paroscopy is difficult, so these people are discriminated from care. I give you a big example in kidney, but in other situation too. Yeah, well, and it's probably a growth industry because people are getting more obese all the time. <laughs> in Illinois, more than one third of people are obese. Oh, it's a terrible problem that I hope will with the time, but it's something we are facing now. What about uh, your uh, future uh, as an administrator? Uh, uh well, again, I, I had to sort of uh, become uh, an administrator um, because this is a department that uh, we have about 140 employees. We have uh, some money going in and out. And uh, administration is a good part of my life now. Do you have a long waiting list or for for the various kinds of robotic surgery? We, we tend to uh, do it. If somebody needs us, we do it. Mm. We don't make people wait. Yeah. We are not uh, saturated yet. We may get that one day, but, but for now, no. And what about your family? You have a daughter? I have a daughter, yeah, uh -huh. She's 10 years old. Is she... How Italian is she? Well, her Italian is perfect. Okay. She speaks and writes Italian as good as any child of her age. And um, she loves going back to Gubbio yeah. or to Sardinia. My wife is from Sardinia. Oh, okay. And what do you imagine for her? She's going to stay in the U.S. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. We may go back, but she won't. In retirement, do you think? Yeah. You, you would go back? At least part of the year I would uh, spend time in Italy. Uh, yeah. Italy is a nice place to be uh, older. And it's more social than uh, the U.S. is, in my view. But, uh, in Gubbio and uh, in Tuscany. Anything I forgot to ask you that you really wanted to say? No, if you were curious about the robot, the robot is part of what we do. We do a lot of open surgery still for liver, for pancreas. So I don't want you to think that I uh, based my career on robotic surgery. That has been a late development. My career has been based on uh, organ transplant and uh, liver surgery, big open case. That we still do, of course. Now, uh, will it become more and more the case that uh, people will get transplants when their organs go bad? Or, uh, well, the limitation is the number of donors. Despite all the effort with Plateau, in 1992 we made a little, really not much improvement since. And despite all this campaign, this advertisement, what are the, I guess I, I don't know if I'm a very good donor, I'm diabetic, but I signed my driver's license. That's nice of you. What, what do you need to do? Would, are Italians like, what about in Italy? Do, are people willing to donate more than they are here or in less? In North Italy, they have one of the highest rates of donation worldwide. Uh -huh. In Southern Italy, not nearly as much. Yeah. Like many things in Italy, they're different. 
in the <laughs> south west of the north. But North Italy is a phenomenal network for transplant. And what about in the U.S.? Uh, uh, ethnic groups? Are there uh, trends in ethnic groups or as regions, as you mentioned? In Italy? Um, sure, not the Italian community. We are supportive of the field and we donate. Other community may be not as supportive. Or they're just not as aware. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Enrico Benedetti. Uh, many more years of success. We'll come back in 20 years. If I come back in 20 years, it'll it's a be good time a for both of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll check up on your progress. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.